to introduce Professor Matt Ratto, who's also an associate dean research, to say a few words. Um, so I'm the least essential person here in the room today. I have the, I have the least essential knowledge to provide to you. The, the staff and and, uh, and also current students who are here have lots of great information to provide to you about the, about the faculty. But I wanted to come and just simply welcome you to the faculty and say how thrilled we are to have you uh, joining us. Um, it's so interesting that maybe coming out of COVID or maybe it's just because of all the media that's happening, you know, uh, information is increasingly a very key area of professional and research practice. Um, uh, and this has been an incredibly competitive year for admissions. Uh, so I really want to congratulate you on receiving your offer and, and again, hopefully joining us. Um, we are uh, thrilled to really see how much information is increasingly mattering. And by information, I don't just mean the sort of like technical aspect of information, but I mean the uh, kind of information institutions, the memory institutions that also continue to matter so much in society. I'm talking here about the libraries, the archives, and the museums, but of course also now the databases, the artificial intelligences, the companies that are increasingly you know, key to uh, how we govern and live in our uh, modern society. So, you know, what you've done is you found yourself um, uh, in the place where we train those disciplines, where we train those professionals, where we provide the educational experience um, to make you be the most successful person you can be in those, in those great areas. Um, it's, it's actually, for me, it's quite interesting to, to look back because when I started my own journey towards uh, an information profession, I mean, I'm an information professional as an as a instructor, as a teacher and a researcher in this field, um, it was odd to imagine that in order to be successful in this kind of practice, you would need uh, both the kind of technical understanding, you need some understanding of these technical systems, um, as well as some understanding of the social implications of those systems. The idea that you would need to be, uh, in order to be successful in these areas, you would need a little bit of computer science and a little bit of sociology and a little bit of history and a little bit of organizational science and a little bit of media studies. When I started it, uh, my journey, these fields were completely separate. It was not, it was not normal to imagine that. But now I think we all completely see and believe that in order to be an information professional requires some understanding of the technical systems, some people are deeper into those systems, um, and some understanding of the social relations and social systems, cultural governance and policy. Um, and that the really the only way to be successful these days is to somehow bring those together. So I'm really happy that you found yourself here in a place where you're going to get a little bit of that. So whether you're focused on library and information science, and you're really focused on the institutional library, you're going to learn about databases, user experience, and um, the technical systems by which those, those things operate. Whether you're a user experience design focused student, um, and you're really interested in the interfaces and user experiences by which we engage with digital information, you're also going to learn about the social, cultural, political aspect of those kinds of systems. If you're interested in data science, I mean, my God, data science, the mo I think data science is probably the most, one of the most political uh, and ethical and moral practices that we have these days. And so if you're interested in data science, you're going to learn both the deep technical skills to be successful there, but also the ethics and moral and the political agendas that accompany that. So I want to really welcome you to this strange flower uh, that continues to bloom here in the faculty, which is this interdisciplinary approach. Um, and I also want to highlight, uh, and I'm sure you already know this, but I'll just highlight it because I'm always so impressed by it the experiential learning and work integrated learning aspects of our program as well, which you know, allows you not just to sort of engage with these themes and these ideas within the, within the classroom, within the sort of like more theoretical context that encourages the engagement with those ideas, with that skilling, with that professional experience, 
out into the into the professions that you want to find yourself in in your next uh, in the next steps in your journey. Um, I want to add one thing too that I know you know, I'm sure you know, and I'm sure you're good at this, but I want to highlight it anyway. Um, reach out to faculty. Faculty are here for you. We are researchers, we are educators, we do all sorts of work uh, that maybe you even find interesting. You know, we've got scholars doing work on generative AI and conversational interfaces. We've got scholars doing work on mental health uh, and uh, the role of libraries and managing mental health. We've got scholars doing work on the importance of immigration systems and immigration and migration. You know, we have we have scholars doing all sorts of interesting things, some, some of which you're going to encounter in your classroom, but some of which you may not. So I really encourage you to look at what the faculty are doing. You know, feel free to browse the website you can talk to them after class or, or between classes um, and reach out if you see things of interest. There, not, there doesn't have to be any particular, you know, need, you know, you don't have to need to create a new program or anything like that. Feel free to just have conversations with faculty. That's actually part of what we're here to do. Education here in the faculty is both a formal practice that you're going to encounter in the classroom, but it's also an informal practice that we, you engage in just through having conversations, of course, with each other, but also with the faculty. So I want to encourage you, don't be shy, reach out to us. We are a growing place, but we're still a relatively small place. We all sort of know each other. So feel free to reach out um, to me and to the rest of the faculty, just if you want to chat about current events, about our research, or about specific classes that you're engaged in. So I'll end there and say uh, absolutely my uh, most heartfelt uh, welcome and congratulations on joining the faculty. And I'll turn you over to the actual substantive part of this, uh, of this day, we're working with the uh, staff and learning all about how the how the how the, how the faculty actually operates. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so before I continue, I just also like to give a big welcome to everybody joining us online. Um, so thank you for for signing in today. Um, this session will also be. Um, we'll be recorded and we'll share it with everybody um, afterwards as well, so you can uh, refer back to it for today's event. And then uh, just a few more housekeeping things. If anyone is looking for the bathroom, we do have um, accessible bathrooms on the fourth and uh, first floor, uh, gender neutral bathrooms on the fifth and third floor, and then bathrooms on every floor next to the elevator. Um, and then feel free to help yourself to um, coffee and uh, drinks uh, throughout the day. Over in that area, and then we also have a lot of stations as well next to the area. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, what are your next steps? Sorry, did I get everyone online? Okay. Um, so, now we're going to go through um, what those next steps are. So, now you've, you've been offered admission to the program. Yay. This is the probably most important step. Um, after that, um, if you haven't already accepted your offer of admission, um, you're going to accept your offer. So you're going to um, sign your offer, download your offer letter, sign it, and upload it to your applicant portal. Um, and then your $500 uh, tuition deposit is due to first, and you can only pay that through credit card um, through your Acorn account. And I'm going to talk about that a little later. It can only be done through credit cards. So if you paid it, if you're, um, you know, an undergrad student at U of T, you're probably used to paying your fees um, through Acorn, through bank, um, direct withdrawal. You can't pay your deposit that way. You will be able to pay your tuition that way, but not the deposit. If you did pay it that way, um, you would have to contact student accounts to get that $500 um, toward your deposit. Um, count towards your deposit, otherwise they would count towards um, your last year's tuition. Um, and we don't want that to happen. Um, so you can get in contact with us if uh, that is what you did, and we can help you sort that out. Um, so Acorn is where you're going to, and we're going to talk more about Acorn um, in July um, when we have our enrollment event, but this is where you're going to go in and you're going to update your mailing address, your number, your emergency contact information, 
Um, so in order to access a form, you need to enable your join ID. Um, so your join ID was given to you when you applied to the program in an email from the School of Graduate Studies. Um, so if you cannot locate that email, um, you can email sjf.admissions.utron.ca uh, and you can um, find out what your join ID is from there. Um, once you enable your join ID um, and activate it, then you will be able to have access or you will gain access to ACORN. Your join ID will then become your new tour ID. Um, so the next step is apply for housing. Um, so there are many different options available for housing. So Grad House is just one option. It's actually really convenient because it's just right out that way. <laughs> Oh, my direction is also good. But Grad House is just a few steps away, so it's very convenient. But the thing with Grad House is there are reserved a uh, reserved number of spaces for each graduate program. Um, so they let us know how many spaces that we have available um, at the beginning of the year. So we have um, six spaces available for MI students and one for museum studies students. So if that's something you're interested in, um, please contact me right away. Um, we have, I believe, like two spots left uh, for MI and one for MNC. So email me right away and I can get you on the priority list. Otherwise, you can um, join the waitlist for Grad House um, and apply through the regular process and to join the waitlist and they will contact you when a spot um, becomes available. But outside of Grad House, um, of course, there are off campus housing um, options available and have some websites available on the screen. Um, and then other U of T housing options as well. A lot of our students, I think, um, tend to um, have off-campus housing. So if you know somebody else in the program or you know someone else at U of T, you can um, rent a place with them nearby. We're in Toronto, so there are so many different places to rent um, around the area. Um, so hopefully you don't have too much trouble finding a place to live. So here's an, um, just a save the date right now. So Saturday, July 15th is when we're going to have our getting started event. And our getting started event is going to be um, your enrollment event. So we're going to go through the enrollment process with you. So you're not enrolling in your courses until the end of July. Um, so July 15th is when we're going to go through all that information with you. How to enroll in your courses, what courses to enroll in. Um, and all that information. So don't worry about that now. There's nothing you need to worry about right now in regards to moving courses. Um, we will go through all that information with you on July 15th. Um, so save that date in your calendar. We will also have an online event for anyone who can't make it in person. Um, and again, we will also record that event so that you can access it later. Um, so you will notice, so for your registration status, and this confuses a lot of students. So I put this up here because um, your status should be set to invited, not registered. So invited means you are able to, you're invited to enroll in courses. Okay, so we want your, your status to, to be invited. Um, so you're invited to enroll in courses, and this is your initial status after being admitted to the program. You're not registered until you pay your, your um, tuition fees um, or have done a referral. And that, again, is something that we'll talk about at the July uh, 15th event as well. Um, but the tuition amounts for 2023-2024 are not going to be available until July. Um, and so you'll be notified once um, those fees become available, and then your invoice will be available through your apron account, um, and you can start making those payments then. Um, but it's not until you pay that that fee that your status changes to register. So you want your status to be in writing. The other thing you want to look at doing is um, apply for collaborative specializations. Does anyone know what a collaborative specialization is? Okay, so um, these are partnerships that we have with other departments at U of T. Um, so you, it doesn't add any extra time to your degree. It just means that the elective courses will be geared towards that specific specialization. So if there's an area that you'd like to focus on in your studies, you want to, to add um, a greater breadth of knowledge to your, your MI or MMST degree, you can apply to collaborative specialization. But because it is a program offered within another department at UT, you do have to apply separately to it. 
So you don't have to apply to it right now. Um, you can if you want. If you want to start it at the same time as your MI or MXD degree, you're certainly welcome to. But you can also apply for them at any point throughout the studies. Um, so in your first year, even in your second year, um, you can apply. Usually they have ongoing deadlines, so you can apply for them at any point. There are some um, that are a bit more competitive, so they do have set deadlines. Um, so for this year, for example, if you're looking to apply to book history and print culture, the deadline was April 11th. Um, but you can still apply next April for that specialization. So you can still do the present specialization if you want. Again, it doesn't add time to your degree. It just means those elective courses would be geared towards that specific topic. Okay. Um, so usually the application process is not very difficult. You can use a lot of the information that you use to apply to the MI or the MMMC degree, um, and it's not typically much more to apply to the specialization. Um, so I mentioned already briefly the uh, paying tuition. So again, you're not going to do that until um, later on. So you can choose to pay per term rather than the entire year. Um, so you can pay in September and then in January. Um, for your fall winter fees, so your fall fees and then your winter fees. Um, but again, that invoice will be available sometime in July. Um, and then to be the deadline to be fully registered, which means paying your fees, is September 1st. Um, so you have to pay your, your tuition by September 1st to uh, be considered registered. Uh, but that's the degree fee. Um, so graduate programs, professional graduate programs, um, have a set program fee. So if we don't charge per course, there is a set program fee. Um, so if you have to finish your degree um, quicker than usually the allotted time, at the end of that degree, you're going to have a balance called a balance of degree fee. So it's just going to be the remaining of the tuition um, owed for the, for the program. Um, so for domestic students, it's roughly around 12000 a year. Um, so you'll just have that, that balance of it um, in a big chunk, basically, when you graduate, if you happen to finish your degree um, sooner. If you are a part-time student, we typically recommend part-time students uh, make a summer tuition payment just so you're not left with a large balance by the time you graduate of your degree. Makes sense? I just want to talk uh, briefly about some of the financial aid opportunities that are available. Um, being a professional master's program, there is a difference between a professional master's program and a research-based master's program. Professional master's programs don't come with a full funding package like a research-based master's program would come. Um, so typically with the research-based master's program, you're required to TA, um, uh, hold a teaching assistant position or research assistant or graduate assistant position, which is typically what makes up a lot of your funding package. With professional master's programs, you're not required to do that. Um, so you're not um, provided with a, a full funding package in the same way. Um, so the way that our students typically fund their, um, their education is through a variety of different resources. So I've broken it down into three kind of clusters to hopefully make it a bit easier. Um, so financial aid, most of our students have some sort of government loan, so OSAP or any other uh, province or other type of government loan. Um, if you are a province, um, or sorry, if you are within Ontario, we will automatically receive your financial aid information, um, your financial needs information directly from um, OSAP. But if you are out of province, you will have to submit an out of province um, financial aid form back on our website. Um, to gain access to additional um, financial support that might be available to um, And so then that would be under the money matter section of our website the form that you would fill out. Um, we also have a PMFA. So PMFA is a grant that helps to um, cover some of the costs that were not provided to you through OSAP or um, government funding. Um, so it helps to, to fill some of that gap. So if you your tuition is twelve thousand dollars and the government gave you nine thousand dollars, there's that gap. So we'll give you a percentage of that gap back um, in the form of a, a, a first rate to help uh, cover that gap. Also available 
Um, so if you encounter an emergency situation, you can't pay uh, your month's rent um, or food for that month, or you have a fire or something, um, there are emergency grants that you can also apply for that are available. Um, students with disabilities. Um, so students with a permanent disability may um, apply through the Canada Student Grant for persons with permanent disabilities as part of their OSAP funding. Um, and then in addition, grants are available through the Ontario Bursary for Students with Disabilities and Canada Student Grant for Service and Equipment for Persons with Permanent Disabilities um, to help with disability-related uh, supports and services. Um, students sometimes also get a line of credit. Um, so if you were able to get OSAP or any of the funding, you can also apply for a line of credit. Um, we do have to approach a social bank. Certainly, you don't have to go with the social line of credit if you don't want to. You can go with any financial institution that you're most comfortable with. Um, so, where's the scholarships? Um, so, we will have what's called an omnibus application. And that application is going to open up August 1st. And we will notify you when something comes available for you to apply to. And it's just one application that you fill out. And it will give you access to a variety of different scholarships and awards that you might be eligible for. So instead of having to apply to each one of them separately, you would fill out this one application and then we would award you hopefully based on um, the criteria listed within that specific um, scholarship. The deadline will be September 30th to fill that out. Some of them get dispersed in the fall and then others get dispersed in the winter. Um, and then there are other, uh, there are external government awards, the OGS um, and SHRP awards that you can apply for. Um, if you haven't received one for this year, you can still apply in your first year to receive for your second year. So just look out for um, those specific deadlines because um, they will differ from your admission deadlines. Um, so you want to go out to the, the government website and look um, for the application process for that. But they range anywhere from 15,000 to 17,500, so they're definitely worth uh, looking into. And then, of course, there are other uh, School of Graduate Studies and U of T awards that you can um, consider applying for as well. There's an Awards Explorer um, document, or sorry, um, database that you can search um, through School of Graduate uh, Studies website that will give you access to additional um, scholarships and awards that you can apply for. And then finally, employment. A lot of our students um, will apply for work study positions. So it's really convenient because you know, you're already on campus, so you can work before, um, between or after classes, whenever is convenient for you. A variety of different jobs um, here at the iSchool or anywhere on campus. Um, the application will open up in August. Um, so just look out for that notification as well. And then, of course, any um, employment that you have. Some of those options. Um, so, any questions so far? I think and, we have one of the, oh, yeah. we have the hand in the back. Absolutely. So, the automatic entrance awards, um, those are um, awarded based on your application to the program and they are merit based. Um, so anyone with a 3.7 GPA and above are automatically considered for them. Um, and those decisions have been released. Um, so if you haven't received anything yet, unfortunately, um, likely not the uh, successful recipient on one of those, um, but yes, those automatic entrance award decisions have been made, been made and students have been notified. But yes, they are highly competitive, um, and there, there aren't many of them available. I'd say about 10% of our students receive some sort of entrance award uh, that range anywhere from 500 to full domestic tuition. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so we're here to support you. Um, so we will be sending out, uh, starting very shortly, a um, new student monthly newsletter. Um, so just look out in your email for that. That'll have all the information that you will need um, to help get you started for the start of class. Um, so every month you'll have um, your next steps, information to look out for. You'll have information like work study and scholarship information um, in that newsletter and um, a lot of other important information. Um, to look at. 
Um, we're going to have a peer advisor session um, coming up um, in June or July sometime. And so every student admitted to the program is assigned an academic advisor who you can go to um, at any point um, during your studies. We have one of them here at the back of the team. So it will have a peer advisor session uh, later on in the summer so you can keep your advices. Um, orientation, same the date for that as well. We're going to have a series of different events and workshops available for orientation um, from August 21st to September 7th. Um, in person and virtual events um, available, so keep an eye out for that. We also right now have uh, drop in sessions every Thursday with our uh, recruitment and admissions officer, Alicia, in the back. Um, so you can drop in anytime if you have any questions uh, from 9 30 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, through the Zoom link. And the first day class is September 7. Um, so mark that on your calendar because that's also a very important date. And um, and yeah, so we will send you all the information to help prepare you for the start of classes in September. Um, and that's it for me. Um, does anybody have any additional questions? If you do think of any questions, we are here all day. Um, so they, I am joined by some of my other colleagues here as well. So we have our assistant Dean Andrew McGee in the back as well, um, who you can come chat with, um, and Chris and Sana and Esmeralda, our first team are also here who you're going to meet a little later as well. Um, some of our students are here that you can come chat with. Um, and there will be lots of um, opportunities to talk to lots of people today and ask all of your questions. So it's okay if you don't have questions right now. Um, so what we can do is we can take a short break. You can help yourself some more refreshments, um, think of each other, and then we will start the next session um, at around 11.